and the world. Ladies and gentlemen, to talk about Premier Wall's legacy from a national standpoint, please welcome acclaimed national commentator Rex Murphy. This is very intimidating. Who do you think I am, Mike Duffy? <laughs> it is extremely intimidating. As, as was mentioned for a long while, I, I worked at, uh, at CBC Radio, so I'm not used to audiences. <laughs> Last time I saw an audience this big, they had bingo guards involved. Uh, I don't know where, well, by the way, um, the 10 minute limit still applies, but in my own case, even saying good morning takes about 10 minutes, so ramble as we may. Uh, I'm the only one here that doesn't know his job or life experience to Brad, so you might be getting a few truths from me. <laughs> I'm not gonna take on Roger Kipling. He's, he's far too advanced for me. Uh, I'm here, incidentally, purely as a result of an error. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> that's obvious. Uh, maybe the schedulers thought that they should put in a pre-fixed anti-climax during these proceedings. <laughs> and I am a professional anti-climax. <laughs> Though not normally in proceedings as, as unintimate as this. Um, I had a call a couple of months ago, and it struck me at the time as a little strange, saying, would you like to come down and uh, say goodbye to uh, Premier Ball? That's White Ball of Newfoundland. And I thought to myself, that's a kind of strange. He hasn't been there that long. But you know, at the same time, I could understand Premier Ball deciding that it was time to get out of the dinghy, <laughs> especially when the cruise ship was just passing by. <laughs> so I said, yeah, sure, you know, I'll, I'll go down. It's, it was only yesterday, and I, I'm giving you some personal details. Only yesterday on a plane that had left Toronto, that I suddenly realized, and you will be familiar with this phenomenon, that it was going west. <laughs> because if you've ever had the experience of traveling west from Toronto, your IQ radically increases. <laughs> and I found myself solving uh, quadratic equations that would baffle Stephen Hawking. <laughs> so with that clue, uh, I stopped to one of the cabin stewards and I said, by the way, isn't you know, Newfoundland uh, you know, the other way? And she said, you, you think so? She said, you're heading out to Saskatoon and that's the first I knew that I was being present at a tribute to Premier Wall, <laughs> not the ball. <laughs> so understand that I am here, A, as an anticlimax, and secondly, purely in error and judge the quality of the remarks you are about to receive on the basis of those two false assumptions. <laughs> uh, I'm digressing, uh, but I haven't begun yet. Uh, <laughs> how do you leave the path if you're not on it? Uh, but anyway, I was, oh yes, I must do this because otherwise it, it, will, it will abandon what I am pleased to call my mind. Uh, last night, uh, I was treated uh, to the honor, it is an honor, uh, to visit the Premier and his wife uh, in their rooms in the hotel. And up to that point, uh, my acquaintance with Mrs. Wall, and I think at this stage I'm allowed a Tammy, uh, had been merely by email, if that. And I then realized, as I now have encountered her, and her courtesy, and her courage, and her spontaneity, her resourcefulness, and her long-suffering, that, you know, the old axiom behind every possibly competent male, <laughs> that would be you, Brett. <laughs> there is a superior female. I like to say, pay a tribute to Tammy. And while you will be fairly soon free from all of his presence, think of Tammy. 
Just always think of Tammy. Let that be your slogan from here on in. Well, why am I here? I suppose one reason that I'm here is that, as opposed to a lot of people, I've had experiences uh, with high official people who have left office. One of the virtues that I will celebrate in, in Brad, and I think I even wrote about it earlier, is that he's doing this under his own will, which is more remarkable uh, than you might think. Some people have the conception that they are indispensable to the public life of provinces or nations. It's a peculiar form of mania. For example, Hillary Clinton is still not free of it. <laughs> she's been wandering to England and Australia, letting the world know that she's still ready to serve if called upon. But I lived in a province, in fact, I grew up in a province where we had a premier who seemed to be older uh, than the rock that he ruled. Uh, he was at it for at least two and a half decades. This was Premier Smallwood. And he was not a great honorer of parliamentary practice. Under Joey Smallwood, most of the cabinet meetings were held in his own mind. <laughs> and even those weren't particularly well attended. <laughs> And his idea of a caucus meeting was to have a second thought, <laughs> which is about two more than you're getting from most of them today. But anyway, at the end of Smallwood's career, they had to hire highway tow trucks and attach a cable with a hook to drag him out of the premier's office. And there are grooves in the mahogany top of his desk that were left by his extended talons as they pulled him away. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is a very good thing to find a leader in politics who not only is willing to go, but has the one human characteristic that we don't normally associate with politicians, the humility to see that it is OK to let others move into the sphere. It might seem like a quick remark, but that particular aspect of character is a remarkable one, and it's one that requires every now and then notice of it to be given. My first acquaintance with this gentleman was, inverted commas, telephonic. We were trying to get on cross-country checkup, uh, the premier. I had not spoken to him before or met him to appear on the program, by telephone, obviously. And Charles Shanks, who is the producer of cross-country checkup, he came to me and said that they'd made contact with the office uh, people and that Premier Wall, I wasn't calling him Brad for sure, that Premier Wall would be giving us an interview during the show, but that he would be doing it from the back, at the, sorry, from the driver's seat of a snowmobile. <laughs> and I looked at Charles and I said, is this true? And he said, yes, it is true. So I volunteered with some considerable hesitation to my producer. I said, well, you know something? there's a possibility that this man might be sane. <laughs> this, this could possibly be a, a human being. <laughs> and if you've been dealing with the creatures that throng Parliament Hill, you'll realize how rare that encounter is. <laughs> the idea that the first, in, first time I've had a conversation with him, he interrupted a snowmobile trip so that he could do a five-minute phone call. And there was a hint there, to me at least, that this was a person of some considerable sanity, uh, which is another virtue you don't often find in the political class. So these are just hints. Now, as I got ready for this particular occasion, I did a few things. They, they let me have your wonderful book, Risk and Reward, last night. And I looked at the very origins of this party, and I found that three journalists in a combined column had written that this party at its beginning was a combination, and I'm quoting now, of recycled reactionaries, disoriented Tories, and renegade washed up liberals. <laughs> and they were writing this as if it were a bad thing. I put it to you, ladies and gentlemen, that recycled reactionaries, discredited Tories, and washed up liberals are the primordial soup of all political creation. 
and it was due to the wisdom and insight of your leader here that he made a combination that endures to this particular moment. Now, by the way, one other thing I should caution you, you're all giving him a wonderful farewell and, and treating him with the reverence that obviously he deserves and the affection that trolls him everywhere he goes. But I also note something that you already know, that he's a great fan of Elvis. And you realize that, what, in the 50 or 60 years since Elvis retired, <laughs> he's been showing up on personal tours at every supermarket where the readers of the National Enquirer show up. I don't think we'll find Mr. Wall in the next 50 or 60 years showing up at the supermarkets, but I'd have a lookout for him at snowmobile dealerships <laughs> and fishing camps. <laughs> Let me just put a few words in there. I don't have the association and the intimacy that the other people who are paying tribute have. I've watched it from the outside, and my comments, insofar as they have any worth, and that's usually a bad gamble, they come to this, that I saw somebody out west or out east, it wouldn't have mattered, but I saw someone out west, and I've already pointed this out, that had the idea in this particular moment that he wasn't indispensable. And I hark back to the very first interview on Checkup, that here was a man who actually knew life as life for most people really is. That in itself is not a gift. The gift comes in realizing that that particular field is something that in the administration of power and government is a very powerful gift. And it is so very, very rare. The idea that the daily context, the daily exchanges, the daily routines from good morning to the sports thing to whatever, this is how we live. And it has become, I think, an al almost pervasive injury to politics everywhere that those who administer the political arrangements, and this is a whole class, politician, journalist, academic, they seem to have forgotten everyone who's under the clouds below, that those who have daily worries, that those who value jobs, that those who might encounter rough and hard times, they haven't got time to float their minds with vast conceptions. Remember always the everyday. It is where people live. The second thing, I noted this, this is a very strong point. Elevation to office has a very strange impact on the majority of people. They suddenly seem released from all of their knowledge of everything that went before. <laughs> and insofar as they claim any new knowledge, it's borrowed and it's part of the clan. It is an amazing thing how a brain can be so erased from its entire inheritance once you're trailing behind a cabinet minister in the federal government. How much you forget in so short a time. This applies to the United States where they've had an election that illustrates what can happen when you forget about the everyday. You elect a man who carries his own china shop with him wherever he goes. <laughs> Brad Wall, on the contrary, saw, pointed to me one thing, connection. There is only one thing that a political class, only one duty that it has, it must remain connected to the experiences of the people who have elected them. It is the only duty, and it is the one in the modern age that is most furiously and frequently violated. So if I were paying a tribute to Mr. Wall, is that he provides a singular example of someone who's had a long term in politics, but somehow, by self-examination or by instinct, has remembered the business that he is at, that those who vote for him are always the first concern. His, I salute his ability to, not to connect, to remain connected while in office. Just one more point. Again, I, I want to extend. I could rattle on forever, which is unfortunately a private vice. 
but I will tell you this. When Newfoundland had a really hard time, that was in the mid-90s, we closed down the fishery. I am really compressing this. 31,000 people tossed out of work. Their life experience is completely jettisoned, and the entire culture of the province smattered. It was awful. During that period, there was a boom out west, and about 20 or 30,000 of our crowd, and I know how difficult we are to deal with. <laughs> we moved out here. There were no borders. People even 55 and 60 years of age got jobs. Marriages were saved. Money was starting to be sent home to parents. You know, again, the day-to-day -day experience. And if that had not happened, Newfoundland would have been in crisis. Unemployment, divorce, booze, the whole game. I saw in my mind what it meant that one section of the Confederation, if its economy was booming, could come to the rescue of another domain. And I respected ever since the possibility that industry of natural resources had such personal, passionate, salvational purpose for people who were waiting for work, for jobs, the dignity that comes from there. And there is only one politician so far across this country, provincial or federal, who is willing to break that airy, august, clouded consensus that the idea of saying a good word about Canada's national energy industry is not some form of heresy. The gift that Brad Wall gave to politics in Canada is that he was not ashamed to say what is actually obviously true. Wind it up this way. It takes, I think I know about this, it takes a little more courage than we sometimes think to separate from your own clan. And when you have these great conferences and these huge summits and all of the big thinkers and all of the great cosmongers get together and they establish a great consensus to be the only one in the room who says, I'm sorry. What appears to you to be unimaginably and transcendentally true is actually foolishness. <laughs> and the idea that we libel or strangulate the most powerful industry that we have, and the one that is central, energy, energy is the primal industry. It drives everything else. The idea that we delimit and strangulate that industry is a form of madness. And there is only one premier that I can remark up to this point who's had the singular conviction and the daring to break from his fellows in that room and say it. And that's worth remarking on. So as I say, I said at the beginning, I, I got here entirely uh, by mistake, and I'm sorry that Premier Ball is not resigning. <laughs> it's even more tragic that I'm heading back to Toronto and the IQ will drop back to its normal, <laughs> its normal state. But I will say one thing, my acquaintance is, has not been frequent, but from afar and from reading what he does, I like the fact that he keeps in mind the people who brought him here, that he's maintained the temperament of a human being even though he is a politician and that he has such magnificent support in the person and presence of Tammy. For you people allowing me to be here and infecting your conference, I thank you.